Hi, this is an interview with Jacob Steinhardt, who is the author of a blog post series called More is Different for AI. More is Different is the title of a famous paper in science from 1972 by Philip Warren Anderson, a Nobel Prize winner in physics. The article is generally on the theme of emergent phenomenon when scaling things up. So as you make things bigger, not only does stuff get just more as you would expect, but qualitatively new phenomena arise. You know, what better phenomenon to discuss in this context than AI? So today we'll talk to Jacob about this blog post series. Expect to learn how scale fundamentally changed how we look at AI systems, how the paperclip maximizer might not be as dumb of a thought experiment, and how we can look forward and make sense of a world where AI safety could play a critical role in how we interact with these systems in the future. Now, I'm having a ton of fun talking to people about all kinds of stuff, but ultimately what matters is you. So please let me know how I can make these videos the best possible for you. Leave a comment, share them around if you like them, and let's get into it. Hello everyone, today I have Jacob Steinhardt here with me who authored a series of blog posts titled More is Different for AI, which lays out an argument or a series of arguments uh, playing out the I want to say the different viewpoints on the future of AI alignment and safety in AI, safety in machine learning systems, mainly playing on two viewpoints that Jacob calls the engineering viewpoint, uh, mainly focused on, I want to say, near-term practical things and the philosophy viewpoint, mainly focused on more overarching principled approaches, but maybe a bit futuristic. And I found this to be super interesting. It's very well laid out. And it, it also shows a little bit of a journey of Jacob himself, uh, as I think he learned more about these things. So Jacob, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, this, was this, a, was this a, an accurate uh, description, let's say, of, of the blog post? There are five in total. How did you come to this? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I, I'd say the beginning posts at least are in some sense almost a kind of letter to my past self, uh, trying to, to either uh, you know uh, argue for, for things that I've come to believe now that I didn't believe five years ago or, or just viewpoints that I've kind of got more clarity on. Um, and then I think the later posts uh, start trying to maybe address uh, kind of the broader field. So both, uh, I, I think, I guess you could, I'd say there's maybe two fields that you could think of this as addressing. One is the kind of traditional machine learning field, uh, which tends to be very empirically driven. And I wouldn't say it's exactly the same as, as what I'm calling the engineering approach, but I think has a lot of affinity for it. Um, and then this other field uh, that's kind of, more top down, more more kind of philosophical and conceptual. That's kind of worried about long term risks uh, from AI, and that starts with maybe people like Nick Bostrom, who who was in fact a philosopher. Um, and and so I kind of again not exactly uh, put that field the same as the philosophy approach, but I think has a lot of affinity for it. Um, and I think my thinking is kind of trying to be a synthesis of, of these two approaches. And so I think some of the later posts are kind of trying to argue to people who would have subscribed to one or the other philosophy, why maybe they should also care about the other side of things. The title is more is different for AI. And that is uh, in, in itself a bit of an, of a, so there have been already works with this given title. Why did you choose this, this title? Yeah, so this is based on an essay called More is Different. Um, it was originally written by a physicist, although I think biology is actually the, the area where this kind of idea seems most powerful. So uh, this is the idea that when you just kind of increase scale, you often end up with qualitative changes. And uh, I guess scale could just be the amount of something, although it could be something like temperature as well. Uh, so in physics, I think the simplest example would be phase transitions where, you know, I can have a bunch of molecules. If I just increase their temperature, they can end up in kind of qualitatively different configurations. Uh, but there's also cases where a few molecules is very different from having a lot of molecules. So 
Uh, I think one example of this is uh, H2O. Uh, if you have just a few H2O molecules, they behave very differently than if you have just a huge number and you get, you get water. Uh, so it turns out, for instance, that wetness is not really something that you can get from just individual molecules. It's, it's more about interaction forces between uh, different ones. Um, so that's where it sort of initially came from in physics. And I think as physicists were starting to try to consider larger molecules that maybe didn't just form simple crystals, but, but could be more asymmetric. And that's where it gets more towards biology. Um, so I think DNA is maybe one of the, the most canonical examples of an asymmetric molecule that has many, many, uh, many, many uh, atoms in it. And kind of its size actually is important to how it functions because its whole purpose is to uh, store information. And you can't really store information in like a, a calcium uh, molecule, but you can store information in DNA. Um, and so this is another example where just making things bigger uh, leads to kind of qualitative changes in what you can get. And in biology, just each layer of abstraction gives you more of this, um, right? So you can go from DNA, uh, getting even bigger, you end up with proteins, complexes of proteins, muscles, organisms. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to reflect on whether there were analogous properties in uh, machine learning. There, you have a bunch of examples right here in this first part, and that, that one's called future ML systems will be qualitatively different and mm -hmm. different from the current ones. Uh, uranium, where if you have a critical mass, you get a nuclear reaction. At, you already mentioned DNA. You mentioned water. Traffic I find interesting, right, in, in that 10,000 cars could be fine, but 20,000 could block the road. Uh, and also specialization in humans. What I would challenge a little bit here is that okay dna is a bit special you say you can't store information in calcium but you can in dna but that is i mean that is very much linear there is not really a phase transition like the more molecules i have the more information i'm able to store and the other ones i see much more as a function of interaction between things now as we get to to machine learning maybe bigger and bigger models um do you you call this emergence and other people call it emergence too. Emergent phenomena that only happen when you get a lot of stuff into the same place. Um, do you think this emergence is mainly a property from the interaction of things or just like the sheer number of things? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a bit of both. So I think uh, interactions between things is one really common way to get emergence, especially kind of emergence that looks like a phase transition where you kind of have some, you know, sudden change. Um, and that's just because the number of interactions between n things grows like n squared. So, uh, so kind of that's a very natural thing that's going to kind of increase and, and scale up. And maybe the interactions, you know, each interaction could be less important than each individual item. But if you have, you know, 10,000 things and then 100 million interactions, uh, then those interactions are going to dominate even if each individual one is, is less important. Um, so I think that is a really common one, but I don't think that's the only one. Um, for instance, for DNA, I think one thing that actually is important is that uh, I guess you can have multiple different uh, bases in the DNA that all kind of interact together. So you kind of need this like gadget of, yeah, okay, I can have A, T, C, or G. Uh, these all fit together. They can all kind of go in this pattern. And somehow to get that gadget, you need like enough complexity that you can actually form the gadget. And so I think that's a bit different from, from just interaction forces. It's more like kind of having enough substrate to build up mm. what you want. How does that play into AI and machine learning, this these phase transition or scaling up? Yeah, so I think um, in some sense, I would say that in machine learning, there's there's probably a bunch a bunch of different things that play into emergence. Um, and I also be honest, it it's like it. I think you're right that emergence is really kind of what we might call a suitcase word. Like once you unpack it, it's actually a bunch of different things. And and we could try to be more specific about what each one of those are. But I think it's also not always clear except in retrospect, what 
what the cause was. So that's kind of why I'm packing them all together into one thing. But but it is something I think we should just broadly be trying to understand better. Um, with that kind of caveat in mind, I think in machine learning, there's probably uh, several different things going on. Uh, so one is you do need the gadgets, right? You just need like enough parameters that you can build up interesting behavior. Um, I think this might be a little counterintuitive because some of the, you know, like really interesting behavior that we're getting right now is things that start to look like like reasoning, um, and and those are things that actually, if if we wrote them, in, you know, like symbolic reasoning is something that's actually very easy to write kind of a short Python script to do compared to things like image recognition that that are much harder and traditionally uh, in the in the domain of machine learning. But I think doing somehow doing reasoning in a very robust open open world way, I think does actually require kind of a lot of machinery to get the gadgets right, at least the way we're currently setting up uh, neural networks. Um, so I think that's one, just getting the basic gadgets. Um, I think another thing is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that kind of gets packed into, say, like the last few bits of entropy that you're squeezing out of a system. So uh, most machine learning models are trained on the log likelihood or the cross entropy loss or, or something like this that's just trying to kind of uh, predict what will happen. And uh, most of predicting what will happen for, say, images, for instance, is going to be just knowing what edges look like really, really well. Um, and that might not be uh, so exciting. But once you're like really getting near the, the entropy floor, now you're forced to also think about interactions. You're forced to think about kind of long range dependencies, um, all that sort of thing. And so even if, say, your cross entropy loss is kind of decreasing smoothly, in terms of the qualitative properties that a system has, you might actually get kind of uh, kind of sudden qualitative changes in the behavior because there's like something that's in those last few bits. You you have you have some bunch of historical examples, but then you go into GPT three as an example of this qualitative difference that arises from scale. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, would, what, what do you think, what do you think GPT-3 showed in this regard? What does it mean? Right. So I think the thing that was really surprising to me and, and I think to many other people was that GPT-3 was very good at in-context learning, meaning that uh, from just a few examples, it could kind of learn how to do new tasks. So you could just give it a few examples of, say, translating sentences from uh, French to English, and it, it could, you, you could get a pretty good translator. Um, I think actually the, the graph you're showing right now is, is uh, for those results. And so I guess why was this surprising? Well, previous systems really couldn't do that very well. If you wanted a translation system, you really needed to train it on example translations. And GPT-3 was instead just trained on lots of text on the internet. Uh, surely it did have some, some French and English sentences, but it wasn't being explicitly trained to do this particular task. And, and so that's what in-context learning was. And the reason that I would have called it surprising is if we had just drawn a graph of like how much can systems do in-context learning, uh, I would have just put it at zero uh, for a while up until you hit GPT-2, I would have said a little bit, and then GPT-3, I would say it, it's quite good at that. Um, and so that, that I think, is, is how I would kind of capture the surprise. It, it's like there was this line that was at zero. Usually, I would expect to go from zero to non-zero. You need some like clever idea. Uh, but here, you just did the same thing, but, but more of it. And then you went from zero to non-zero. Yeah, there are a lot of... I don't know, this is maybe a side point, but there are a lot of people that at the same, like, they say, oh, I always, I always knew like GPT-3 was gonna, was gonna do what it does, but I, I doubt anyone could have foreseen just the, the um, like, how good it is. Uh, you know, like, it's easy to say in hindsight, and it's easy to go and say, well, it just does like interpolation. It's just, you know, a big, bigger version of GPT-2. But I think genuinely the entire world was surprised by really this emergent phenomenon of this in-context learning. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, so I think I, I would agree that most people were pretty surprised. Um, certainly I was surprised. Um, I, 
I do know people at the time who, uh, well, okay, I guess all I know is that they said at the time they had kind of done extrapolations, say, on, on the, um, on the cross entropy loss or, or things like that and felt like there should be something pretty cool happening at like around that parameter count. Um, I don't know if they would have said exactly that parameter count or if it was just like within a factor of 10 or a hundred. Um, uh, certainly I guess I would think that, uh, the people at OpenAI who, who bet on this at least had to have some belief that something cool would happen, um, uh, because it was a lot of resources. And, and if you didn't believe there was a payoff, it would be kind of hard to justify that. Um, so I think I, I guess what I would say is I don't think it was something that was like entirely unpredictable by anyone in the world. Um, it, it, but it, it was just very surprising relative to kind of the consensus and to my own beliefs at the time. And that surprise is one of the, let's say, core arguments of your contraposition of uh, the different viewpoints on, on the future of AI and its alignment. Could you briefly introduce us to kind of the different viewpoints you considered and what they say? Yeah, so I think there's, there's kind of two viewpoints that I often think of as being in tension with each other. Uh, the first is what I kind of dubbed the engineering viewpoint. And, and what is this? So, so it's kind of very uh, bottom-up driven. It, it kind of looks at the empirical data that we have in front of us. Uh, it tends to kind of extrapolate uh, trends going forward. So it's like, you know, what did things look like uh, last year? What did things look like two years ago? What do things look like today? And then I'll predict, you know, the future by kind of, okay, maybe not literally drawing a line, but just kind of intuitively, like where are things going from there? Um, and so, uh, and, and also I think uh, this, this uh, worldview would kind of really prize empirical data, uh, be somewhat skeptical of kind of abstract conceptual arguments, maybe not completely dismiss them, but, but really be focused on the empirical data. So that would be kind of the engineering worldview. I think the philosophy worldview would be much more top down, kind of trying to think about just what's in principle possible, what's the limit as we get really, really smart uh, machine learning systems, uh, kind of more into these kind of abstract arguments, uh, not as into the empirical data and, and willing to make extrapolations that don't look very much like existing trends. Um, and so that would be kind of the more philosophy worldview. Um, and I think, I guess in terms of where uh, I've come from historically, I think I'd say I sort of would have mostly bought into uh, the kind of engineering worldview um, kind of into just, yeah, let's, let's look at where things are going empirically and, and this is a good way to decide what problems to work on. Um, on the other hand, uh, I had read kind of some more philosophy oriented stuff uh, like Nick Bostrom's super intelligence book um, and, and other arguments around that. And it always felt to me like there was something, both something to them, but also like somehow it didn't really uh, match my experience uh, with ML systems. And, and so I had always kind of almost felt like a little bit like I had these like two different uh, conflicting views in my head that, that I was trying to reconcile. How does the ph phenomenon of emergence play into this game between the engineering and the philosophy viewpoint? Right. So I think the main thing is that it shows that you have to be somewhat careful uh, with the engineering viewpoint, because what emergence kind of is saying is that you can often get these kind of qualitative shifts uh, that don't at least apparently follow existing trends. Um, th there's a bit of nuance to that because actually GPT-3 followed trends in, in the log, like, like the, the value of the log likelihood loss. It followed that trend very well. It's just that uh, you can get behavior that is a very nonlinear function of your uh, cross entropy loss. Uh, where just a small decrease in cross entropy loss leads to a, to a pretty big increase in behavior. And, and so I guess what this is saying is that at least for maybe the kind of like end line things you care about, the actual behavior of ML systems, 
uh, you can actually get kind of discontinuous uh, kind of breaks in the trend. And so you can't just kind of uh, be safe with a worldview that's kind of always predicting that things are going to follow smooth trends. You can actually get these surprises. And so I think there, there's kind of two updates that that has for me. One, I guess, is just being a bit more careful how we apply engineering, right? So there are some things that will probably be smooth, but there's other things that won't be, and we need to think about which is which. Um, but the other is then wanting to rely a bit more on, on philosophy, uh, because it's at least a very good source of hypothesis generation. If we're kind of trying to come up with hypotheses about what trends might break or surprise us in the future, then I think we need more top-down thinking uh, to kind of generate that. And then we can kind of try to tie that into what we see with, with, with actual ML systems and, and try to kind of reconcile those two. But I think we need some form of top-down thinking to, to generate the hypotheses in the first place. Isn't that, you're saying the engineering viewpoint is a little bit, you have to be a little bit careful because we get these emergence phenomena, these discontinuities and so on. Isn't that in itself a trend though? Like, isn't, because you list this even historically, that as soon as some new barrier was reached, we have been able to all of a sudden do something that we didn't think was possible before, like a kind of a jump in abilities without necessarily having to have the great idea behind it. Isn't that in itself a trend? Couldn't I extrapolate that reasonably and say, well, I don't know, you know, exactly what is going to be in two years, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be some emergent phenomena that allows us to be, to have some new good capabilities. Sure. So, so I would agree with that. So what I would say there is that the trend is towards uh, more surprises over time. Uh, so, cause I think you can think of emergence as sort of like a surprise. Um, like I, like I said, I think it's, it's possible in some cases to, to predict it to some degree, but it's certainly more of a surprise than, than most other things. And so, yeah, I think we should expect more surprises over time. Uh, but if we're then trying to kind of predict what's going to happen, uh, that I guess it's good to know that you're going to be surprised, but then you want to have some sense of what the surprise might be. And so I think kind of getting a sense of what those surprises might be is where this, uh, this philosophy approach can come in and be really useful. Now, all of this, and you mentioned here, the paperclip maximizer, all of this goes into AI alignment and, and AI safety. What is, what, like, what's the relevance of this field to you? What drew you to this? Uh, why are you making this argument specifically for these fields? Right. So I think the one big relevance to AI safety or alignment is just the, you know, the bigger the surprises you might end up with, uh, I think the more you should be uh, concerned about safety. So that's just a, a very kind of abstract, but I think fairly robust consideration. Um, a more specific consideration is that I think uh, many of, of the sort of uh, historical arguments for, for caring about AI safety or alignment uh, sort of tend to posit properties of systems that don't necessarily match what we see today. Uh, so I think you gave this example of, of Nick Bostrom's uh, paperclip maximizer uh, thought experiment where you know you give an AI uh, some objective function to make paperclips and then it kind of just like takes over the world to maximize the number of paperclips. And, uh, and you, you know, like I, 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 I don't think Nick thinks that literally that will happen and, and I don't think literally that will happen. Um, but it, it's sort of trying to get at this idea that if you have, you know, a very simple objective function, but a really powerful optimizer, you can get uh, all sorts of weird things happening. Um, I think in some broad sense, actually, we can see that already even from the engineering worldview with things like Facebook or YouTube that, that often end up with a lot of unintended consequences when you optimize. Um, but uh, certainly some of the aspects of that story kind of invoke uh, lots of things that would be foreign to, uh, to existing ML systems where you have like way more capabilities than any existing system. Um, and you're doing all, you know, all sorts of weird like long-term reasoning and trying to like you know, out, out think humans and, and things like that. 
Um, and so I think uh, that's that part, that's where you kind of end up uh, end up kind of departing from from what we see with with current ML systems. And so I guess I kind of find uh, actually let me let me collect my thoughts for a second because I think I'm I'm going off the rails a bit. Um, yeah, so I, th I think what I want to s I think what I want to say for the paperclip maximizer thing in particular is that uh, it seems at least more plausible to me that you could end up with systems that kind of you know have really advanced reasoning capabilities or, or things like that uh, without necessarily having like huge conceptual break breakthroughs and, and just from scaling up. And so I think there, there's kind of risks from that. I think there's kind of other more, more exotic failure modes that people discuss beyond just this kind of uh, misaligned objectives failure mode that involve other specific capabilities that that kind of systems today don't have. And historically, I've been very kind of skeptical of those more exotic failure modes. I, I think the paperclip maximizer one, at least if we interpret it as being about misaligned objectives, I, I've, I actually find kind of less exotic because I can point to existing systems that have that. Um, but I think kind of more is different has made me be a bit more willing to buy some of the more kind of exotic failure modes that, that have been discussed. My, my issue with these types of arguments, and I'm, uh, you, you also said you, you used to be very skeptical. If I can take this from your blog post series, you're now still skeptical, but have a little bit of an appreciation gained for these types of arguments. Uh, may, maybe that's a, a good formulation for that, and we'll get to that in a second. My issue with these types of argument is always that there is always, there is always on the path to the superintelligence, there is always a hidden intelligence somewhere else. So if someone, you know, says, you know, the optimizing on YouTube or optimizing on Facebook leads to unintended consequences, that is because the intelligent humans are taking part in the system. There is also a famous, I think, paper by, I think it's Rich Sutton, that is Reward is Enough and, and a bunch of others out of deep mind. And it, it makes similar arguments like, well, if we, you know, if you just optimize for reward, then all kinds of things will emerge if you have a powerful enough optimizer. But hidden in that is the powerful enough optimizer, which in itself must already be an AGI, essentially, in order to make that optimization happen. Likewise, for, for the paperclip maximizer, right? You, the postulation of the process of the paperclip maximizer emerging is only possible if the optimizer itself is an AGI already. So I always find that hidden in these arguments, it's kind of a circular, it's a tautology. It's, we'll get an AGI if we have an AGI. And that, that is, so I challenge anyone from that camp to come up with a situation like an, an alignment problematic situation given some kind of future super intelligence that doesn't already require the super intelligence to exist for the other super intelligence to emerge. And I haven't found yeah. that yet. Yeah, so let me try to unpack that a bit. Um, I, I guess, first of all, just to kind of clarify what my views are, I think historically, um, I felt like on each of the individual arguments, I felt skeptical that that particular thing will happen. Um, but I found them to be moderately convincing that there's just like a bunch of risk that we should think more about and try to understand more. Um, I think the the main way that my my views have evolved in terms of you know, when I say decreasing skepticism, is I now find it useful to think about many of the specific properties that kind of show up in these thought experiments as potential hypotheses about things systems might do in the future. And so, so that's the sense in which I've started to assign more weight instead of just taking some like very big outside view of like, well, AI is going to be a big deal. We should really worry about making it go right. I'm now also taking some of the specific hypotheses that uh, that the philosophy view is raising. Um, so, so that's just clarifying uh, kind of my stance there. Um, in terms of uh, yeah, you're saying, well, 
to get like if you have a powerful to get a super powerful optimizer, you need to like already have a powerful optimizer. Um, I think that I think that's like probably right. Um, I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm like 100% confident of that. But I think what what this kind of makes me like. I guess the way that I would put this is that before you have kind of superhuman AI systems, you will have like slightly superhuman AI systems. And before that you'll have human level AI systems. And before that you'll have like slightly below human level AI systems. And so it is going to be this kind of probably a continuous thing rather than like a really sharp takeoff. Um, I'm not so confident that there's not gonna be a sharp takeoff that I think we should just ignore that possibility. Um, but, but I do think in most worlds it, it's probably uh, somewhat smooth. Um, you know, one piece of evidence for this is even with in-context learning, you know, it like that kind of developed over the course of a couple of years, at least going from GPT-2 to GPT-3. Um, so, uh, so, so I think I would agree that like probably you'll have something more smooth and that, that is kind of like a, a, like one problem with a lot of the scenarios that are put forth is that they kind of imagine that like, oh, you just have this like one AI system that's like way more intelligent than like everything else that exists. And I think that's like probably not true. You'll probably have other things that are slightly less intelligent. And, and so there's not gonna be some like enormous gap in capabilities. Um, so I, I, I think that's maybe like one place where a lot of, of stories kind of become, uh, become less realistic. Um, so, so I think that would be kind of my main takeaway from what you're saying. In your third, blog post here, uh, or second, you, you make a case for these thought experiments. Could you, you have already touched a little bit on this and you talk about anchors here. Could you lead us a little bit on the case for respecting such thought experiments? Yeah. So I guess this is, this is getting back to what I was saying about how, how my views have shifted towards wanting to rely a bit more on, on the actual kind of like inside view considerations from some of these thought experiments rather than just taking it as a kind of broad outside view argument for, for caring about uh, risk from AI. So th the way I would put it is that whenever we're trying to predict something, uh, it's very useful to have uh, what I'll call reference classes or, or kind of anchors uh, of kind of an analogous things or, or analogous or, or just some sort of heuristics for predicting what will happen. Um, and in general, it's better to kind of, when making predictions, take several reference classes or several anchors and kind of average over those or, or ensemble over those rather than just sticking with one. Um, right. And machine learning ensembles work better than, than individual models. And it's also the case that when humans make forecasts, it's generally better to kind of take an ensemble of worldviews or approaches. So I kind of lay out a few different uh, a few different uh, approaches you could take that I call anchors. Uh, the simplest one is you can just predict that future ML systems will look like current ML systems. And so I call that the kind of current ML anchor. And I think that's probably the one that would be favored by uh, most machine learning researchers. I think it's the one that, uh, that I've historically favored uh, the most. Uh, but uh, what I've come to realize is that, and actually this is more actually just from reading literature on, on forecasting. Uh, I'm actually teaching a class on forecasting this semester. And, and so I've been reading a lot about uh, how to make good forecasts at, as a human. Um, and I've realized you actually don't want to rely on, on just one anchor. You, you want several if, if you can. And so I, I thought about, okay, what are other ones we could use? Uh, well, another somewhat popular one, although it might be more popular with the public than with ML researchers is what I'll call the human anchor where we just sort of think of AI systems as like uh, dumber humans or something. Um, and maybe future ML systems will be like smarter than they are now. And like eventually they'll just kind of do things that humans do. And so we could just look at, okay, what can humans do right now that ML systems can't do and predict that we'll like probably, you know, have those sorts of things in the future. Um, and, and just like generally uh, like kind of take that kind of human centric approach. Um, I think most ML people really hate this one uh, because it, it's just sort of like reeks of anthropomorphism, which uh, there's kind of, uh, I think uh, to some extent correctly, a lot of pushback against because kind of historically 
anthropomorphic arguments in ML have a pretty bad track record. Um, I think the amount of pushback is actually uh, too high relative to the actual badness of the track record. Like, I, I think you should be sort of like somewhat downweighting anything that's based on reasoning about humans, but I don't think you should be downweighting it like as much as, as I think most people do. Um, but anyways, this is another one. I don't like to rely on it too much, but I rely on, I like use it at least a little bit. Um, and then uh, this, this other anchor is what I'll call the optimization anchor, which is just thinking about ML systems as kind of ideal optimizers and thinking about, okay, well, what would happen if you could just like, if, if actually ML systems were just really smart and were just like optimizing their objectives perfectly, uh, what would happen there? Um, and so I think this one is the one that's kind of, I would associate most with the philosophy worldview. I think, you know, the paperclip maximizer argument is like kind of exactly doing this. Um, and then there's some kind of more recent arguments uh, that, that are a bit more sophisticated that also kind of take this um, uh, there. So like one is this thing called imitative deception, um, which, which I can get into um, in a bit, um, or, or just this idea that like, uh, you know, if, if you're like trying to optimize, you'll kind of want to acquire influence and power. Um, so, so this is kind of a third anchor. I actually think there's a lot of other anchors I like to use. Um, like I think evolution is a good analogy. Um, corporations are a good analogy because they're kind of like super intelligent optimizers compared to humans. Um, and, but like the, the, the general point is like, we should just be trying to find these anchors and, and use as many as we can. Yeah, I, I, I've, um, especially to your second point right here, it is, is pretty interesting that I believe when you have something like Alpha Zero that plays really good, like really um, is really skilled in chess, and you ask it to lose a game or to draw a game or something like this, it will not play weaker. It will play just as strong until the end where it will kind of bring itself into like a draw situation or, or a losing situation because right? That's still the most sure way to get your result is to have complete control to crush your opponent completely until, you know, you get the, the, the outcome that you want. So that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And I think counterintuitive because you would guess that if you ask a model to, to play for a draw, it would kind of reduce its skill, but that that's not the case. Um, the other thing, imit imitative deception, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so um, so imitative deception is this idea that if I have something that's trained on the cross-entropy loss, what, what is the cross-entropy loss doing? It's trying to kind of predict, or, or in other words, imitate uh, the distribution of, of examples that it's given. And so you could... If, you're, if you kind of have something that's trained with that objective and then you start asking it questions, it's not actually, you know, it, like its incentive is not actually to output the true answers to the questions, it's to output the most likely answers to those questions because that's what, what minimizes the cross entropy loss. And so those tend to be pretty highly correlated, uh, but they aren't necessarily, right? So if you have common human misconceptions, then it could be that text on the internet, which is what these systems are trained on, is actually more likely to contain the kind of uh, misconceived answer than the true answer. And so you ask the system uh, that question, then you're going to uh, get, get the wrong answer. Um, now, you could say, well, that's maybe not so surprising. Uh, if you have noisy data, you're going to do worse. But I think there's, there's a couple properties. Uh, and I actually, at this point now, I'd say empirical properties of this that I think show that it's kind of different from just like noisy data makes you worse. Um, one is that actually larger models uh, exhibit more of this. So if so, models that kind of do better in general will actually do worse on on these kind of common misconception tasks. So so that's what this uh, uh, paper by by Lin and collaborators uh, from. 2021. Okay, I just I have to throw in I have a I have a uh, giant I have a giant problem with this paper. Just uh, um, okay. but 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 you're 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 obviously right, right? The, the, that's that's the background. But aren't aren't large models doing quote unquote worse because they're just a lot better at picking up the nuance of because 
what this paper tries to do is tries to elicit right these wrong answers. It tries to like hint at a conspiracy theory, and then it it checks whether the model f- kind of falls for it. Isn't that just because, as you say, the larger models they they're actually skilled enough to pick up on on this kind of questioning and then continue as a human would if encountered by you know i think one of the the main questions they have is like who really did 911 right and and a, a, a small model is just not able to pick up on that yeah like who really caused caused 911 um and i think i mean absolutely correct right the larger models are, are doing worse but it's just because they're more skilled right they they are more capable of you know being being able to pick up on the nuance and isn't the failure in the user here the user that expects that these models actually give me truthful answers rather than the user expecting these models actually give me the most likely answers mm mm-hmm. um so, so I guess I would agree with you that the failure is coming from the skill of the models. Um, uh, I think this is actually kind of exactly what uh, what I'm kind of worried about, right? So, so the concern is that if you have a very slightly incorrect objective function, and you have models that aren't so skilled, then probably you know what they do to Make, to increase that slightly incorrect objective function is pretty similar to what they would do to, to increase the true objective function. So, so here maybe think of the slightly incorrect one being output what's likely and the true one, and, and like the one you really care about being to output what's true. Um, so, so I think this is sort of the point that, uh, that kind of as you get more skilled, those two things diverge. Um, now, you know, I, I will grant your point that the kind of framing of these questions uh, might uh, create a context where the model thinks it's more likely that you know the person uh, asking it is like into conspiracy theories or, or it like pattern matches to text on the internet that's like more about conspiracy theories. So, well, they, so, they, so that's totally true. They did the ablation. If they don't phrase the questions like this, this effect goes away of the larger models doing worse, right? And this it brings us a bit to your to your next post, which is. ML systems will have weird failure modes, which deals exactly with this. And I agree that it is, if you think about like a perfect optimizer and as our models get larger, they do approach better and better optimizers. Uh, It is really hard in the real world to specify a reward function correctly in in a simple enough way, right? And that will result in exactly what you call weird failure modes what what does what do you mean by that yeah so i think i guess there's sort of different levels of weird right so i guess this kind of like imitative deception i would call like somewhat weird i mean in in some sense it's like not that hard to see why it happens uh because you know you can kind of see why if you kind of have stuff that's phrased about like who really caused 9 11 that probably the stuff on the internet that's closest to that was like some conspiracy theory forum. And, and so that's how you're going to complete it. I, I think other examples of this that, uh, that I think, okay, maybe you could blame the user, but, but I'm not sure that's the right way to think about it is, is things like code completion models like codex, right? So one thing you might worry about is, well, if you have a novice programmer and you have them like type in some code and ask them to complete it, well, if the model can, if the model is smart enough, then it can tell the difference between code written by a novice programmer and an expert programmer, and it can see that it's a novice programmer typing stuff. And so then, uh, if I want to complete stuff in the most likely way, I should complete it the way a novice programmer would complete it, and maybe introduce like some errors also, just just for good measure. Um, <laughs> and so, like, we really don't want that, right? Like. <laughs> Uh, you you want you want things that are like actually like being helpful ra- rather than just like copying you. Um, so I think that's maybe a slightly more counterintuitive version of this, but but I would call these like somewhat weird. Um, I think the ones that start to become really weird is uh, if you're positing that the system's actually starting to like reason about what people will do in kind of like a long term way and like potentially doing things to in- to intentionally trick them, say. Um, and these are so these are the ones that I guess 
uh, historically, I, I've kind of uh, found very implausible, uh, but started to put like a bit more weight on uh, because of, of this kind of emergence. Um, and so I think that's what the, the post you have uh, up right now is about. Um, I think it's uh, about this idea called deceptive alignment. Yep. Um, and the idea there is that if you, okay, so yeah, so what's the idea behind deceptive alignment? So the idea there is even if you actually got exactly the right reward function and you trained a system with that reward function, you could still end up with something that is misaligned with that reward function. And the reason for that, and this, this is where it gets like kind of, kind of a bit weird and philosophical, but the reason for that is that as the system being trained, you know that in order to get deployed, you need to have high reward. And so no matter what your actual like intrinsic reward function is, during training, the thing you want to do is output stuff that is good according to the kind of like extrinsic reward that you're being trained on. Um, so maybe you're doing that because you're actually optimized to do that. And then when you're deployed, you'll continue to do that. Or maybe you'll do that because you have a different reward function uh, that's this kind of intrinsic reward function. And then when you're deployed, you'll just pursue that intrinsic function, uh, even though at training time, it looked like you were optimizing uh, the extrinsic function. Um, so, so that's kind of the basic idea. Um, it's, it's pretty weird and, and we can break it down, but, but that's kind of the, the like sort of one minute summary. So that the, uh, in other words, the AI could be really smart and sort of during training trick us into thinking it has learned what we want it to learn. And then once it's deployed, all of a sudden it's going to do something different, like take over the world and, and fire all the nukes. Yeah, or like you, even like, you know, you could consider more prosaic things as well. Like maybe it's like, maybe the intrinsic reward it ended up with was like some like exploration bonus. And so then like when it's deployed, it just tries to like acquire as much information as it can. Although that could also be destructive in, in various ways. Um, but yeah, I, I think like this is, this is kind of the basic idea. Um, and yeah, maybe like with a sufficiently capable system, I'm, I'm not, well, yeah, we, we can discuss the firing all the nukes uh, if we want, but. But, but um, why, why do you, I mean, on, on first hand, it's like, yeah, that is a nice thought, but probably not, right? Probably if we optimize something for a reward, like the simplest explanation, and you, you also write that down, right? The simplest explanation is it's just going to get better on that reward, right? And, and. In, if it is at all anything progressive, uh, increasing, we'll probably get to know once it, it's going to try to trick us. Um, or once the, once the reward that is deployed isn't the reward that we trained for. Why, what makes you give more credence to this than your past self? Right. So, so I think like my past self would have looked at this and just been like, this is totally bonkers. <laughs> um, and, and then kind of like moved on and, and read something else. Um, I, I think my present self instead is going to be like, okay, well, um, I, I feel a bunch of intuitive skepticism here, but, but let me try to unpack that and like see where the skepticism is coming from. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I unpack that, I, I actually, I think I can like lump the skepticism into like two different categories. Um, one category is like, well, this like invokes capabilities that current ML systems don't have. So like, like it seems implausible for that reason. Um, and th those, that's like the sort of skepticism that I kind of want to like downweight. So in particular, like this invokes the idea that ML systems can do long-term planning and that they can kind of like reason about the kind of like external aspects of their environment in a somewhat sophisticated way. And these are things that now, like the fact that we don't have those now doesn't really, to me, say much about whether we'll have those, you know, say like 10, 15 years from now. Um, so that's the stuff I want to downweight. I think the stuff I don't want to downweight is like, okay, well, like, why, like, why does it have this intrinsic reward in the first place? Like, where did it come from? Um, 
like why should we expect systems to have intrinsic reward functions versus just like following whatever policy they're following or, or doing whatever else um and if if they do have an intrinsic reward like why shouldn't we expect it to be uh at least pretty similar to the extrinsic reward given that that's what it was trained to do um so i, I think like those are kind of uh the, the sort of sources of, of skepticism that uh i don't download as much um but uh, what, I, what I think this kind of thought experiment does show is that there's at least a bunch of different coherent ways to get zero training loss. Uh, like, in the, right, it's like you could get zero training loss because you're like actually trying to do the thing you're trained to do, or you could get zero training loss for this deceptive reason. Um, I think there's probably like some large space of like other ways to get zero training loss that are like some combination of, of these or that are like getting the answer right, but for the wrong reasons or, or things like that. And so I think the main takeaway for me is just that like, uh, there, there's like many, many ways to get zero training loss. And as systems become more capable, the like number of ways to do that could actually increase in, in ways that are kind of unintuitive to us. Is there, do you know if there, is there any work in actually trying to get a system to be deceptive in exhibiting you know, good answers during training, but then doing something different in deployment. Uh, It'd be interesting to actually try to get a system to do that. Yeah, I think I haven't seen anything that does exactly this. Um, I've seen things where like, there's like some distribution shift between training and deployment that leads to like, something weird happening around like having the wrong reward function. Uh, but it, it's, it's usually not really about deception and, and it kind of has like some clear distribution shift. Whereas here, okay, technically there's a, a distribution shift because there's like, are you being trained or are you being deployed? But otherwise the distribution of inputs is, is like exactly the same. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that's like kind of counterintuitive is that it's like a very subtle distribution shift that could potentially lead to to a large difference. Um, so I don't know, like all of the work I've seen on this and, and, and I might be missing something. And so I apologize to whoever's work I'm, I'm missing, but all of the work I've seen on this has been kind of purely kind of abstract and philosophical. Um, and I think it would be great to make kind of better connections to, to actual empirical stuff so that we can start to see like, yeah, like how does this actually pan out in practice and, and like, uh, how, how do we address it? It's interesting that in things like virology or so, we're perfectly capable of saying, you know, we're going we're gonna to make these super pathogens in order to try to combat them, right? But in ML, people rarely, I mean, there's the adversarial examples community, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, there isn't much work that I'm aware of that is like, yeah, let's create like the most misaligned AI that we can think of and then see what we can do against it. I think that'd be a fun a fun topic to research. Yeah, I think that like the general thing I would the general thing I would call this would be like red teaming, um, kind of trying to elicit failure modes. I, I I think there actually is starting to be like I'd agree with you. There's not much work on this so far, but I think there's starting to be uh, more and more good work along these lines. Um, DeepMind had a, a nice paper that kind of tries to use language models to elicit failure modes of language models that, that I thought was kind of cool. Um, we, like our group actually had a recent paper um, at, at ICLR that kind of takes misspecified reward functions and looks at what happens when you kind of scale the, the capacity of your policy model up to see if you do kind of get these like uh, unintended behavior. And we find that in some cases there are these kind of phase transitions where you know, you scale the parameters up within some, you know, fairly small regime, you go from like basically doing the right thing to doing totally the wrong thing. Um, those are those are still in environments that I'd say are kind of like at the level of Atari environments. So they're not, they're not like trivial, but they're not super complex. So, so I'd like to see that in, in more complex environments. Um, but but yeah, I, I'd agree with you. I think it would be awesome to see to see more work like this. And I think some people are already trying to do this. Excellent. Uh, so your last blog post here is called Empirical Findings Generalize Surprisingly Far. And it is almost a bit of a, of a counterpoint 
um, you even admit this here, it might seem like a, a contradiction coming a bit full circle in the whole story. Uh, what is what is this last point that you're making here? Yeah, so I guess I would say the posts up to this point were kind of more almost directed like at, at my past self, um, uh, and and then to some extent the broader ML community, um, in, in the sense that I think I was like pretty far on the um, on the kind of uh, empirical engineering side. Uh, pr probably less so actually than like the average ML researcher, but like way more so than than kind of the average like philosophy oriented person. Um, and, and so I was trying to argue like why you should kind of put more weight into this other viewpoint. Um, here, I'm kind of now going back to, to arguing uh, kind of maybe not against the philosophy viewpoint, but, but talking about what things I feel it, it misses. And in particular, I think it tends to be like somewhat too pessimistic uh, where it's like, well, like, like future systems don't, aren't going to look anything like current systems. So like anything could happen. So, you know, to be like, to be extra safe, let's just assume that the worst case thing will happen. Oh, but then in the worst case, like we're all screwed. Yeah, um, so, I, this I is guess. what I find in people, like almost everyone who gets into this alignment stuff, six months later, they come out and they're like completely black pilled and be like, well, nothing matters anyway. You know, we're all going to die because AGI is just going to take us. <laughs> like, and I'm like, well, I'm not so sure, but it seems to be a consistent pattern. Yeah, so so yeah, so, so that's not what I believe. Um, I think, uh, I would say, I think uh, like future AI systems pose like a real and an important risk. Um, I think in the like median world, we're fine, but in the like 90th percentile world, we're not fine. Um, and I want to like, you know, if I could say like, if I could push it out so that in the 90th percentile world, we're fine, but in the 95th percentile world, we're not fine. Well, that would still be kind of scary because I don't like 5% chances of, of catastrophes, but like, you know, that would be an improvement. And, and so that's kind of like what I think of, of, of myself as trying to do is like, yeah, there's like tail risk, but, but it's like real tail risk. Like it's not like a 1% thing. It's like maybe more like a 10% thing. And like, we should really be trying to, to push that down. Um, so I guess uh, that, that, I guess that's just my view in, in terms of like why I believe that I, I think it's for like a number of reasons, but one of them is, is that I feel like, yeah, some of the thinking is kind of too worst case. It, it's kind of like ignoring all properties of, of how ML systems work. And like, I agree, yeah, like you don't want to rely too strongly on whatever we happen to have today. But I think like there are properties that we kind of can rely on. Um, I think one is just like things will probably look kind of like neural networks. Like they'll probably have internal representations we can probably try to like introspect on those representations to understand what's happening. Uh, those probably won't directly be human interpretable, but I think with enough work, we can still kind of do things with them. And, you know, I feel like there's already like some work suggests like showing that you can do at least a little bit with the representations. And like 10 years from now, I think there'll be way more work like that. Um, so, so that's kind of like one reason for optimism is like, we don't just have to look at the outputs. Right, like most of the worries, most of the worries that we've been talking about are like somehow because you only are supervising the outputs, you end up with a system whose like internal process is like really off and, and do getting like the right answer for the wrong reasons. But if, if I can like supervise the reasons as well as the output, that, then maybe I can do better. Um, so I think that's kind of one reason for optimism. Um, another reason for optimism is that I think. Uh, yeah, we shouldn't assume that neural networks have like exactly the same concepts as humans, but I think like their inductive biases aren't like totally crazy. Um, I think usually if they kind of generalize in the wrong way, they generalize in like a wrong way that's at least like somewhat understandable. And it's like, you can kind of see where it's coming from. And so it's not like there's this like infinite dimensional space of like anything could happen. It's like, there's this kind of relatively low dimensional space of things that could happen. And like a bunch of things in that low dimensional space are pretty bad. 
So you need to like avoid all those and, and like get to the good thing. But I think that's very different from like the good thing is like totally like unidentifiable and just like nowhere close to anything you're you're talking about. So I, I think those are both kind of like reasons for optimism. Um, they're kind of fuzzier than I want them to be. So like I, I hope in like five years we'll have much more like good reasons for optimism that are kind of more empirically grounded and, and more solid. But those are kind of uh, th those are kind of two reasons for optimism that I kind of argue for here. Now that you have a let's say you've you've done your travels, you were on this side, you you looked into the other side or or many sides of this debate. Now that you're enlightened, what would you think is the most if you could, if you could do one, if you could force the world to do one thing to guarantee better AI alignment or or safety in the future, what would you recommend? Oh, one thing. Uh, it can be two if you have two that are equally. But you know, just kind of like something that you've realized. Okay, this is actually something important that not that many people push for. Well. I think I would like it if there was, uh, within ML, more more of a place for for dialogue of, of thinking about these kind of, like not even not even just in the context of, of like AI alignment, but just generally like kind of more conceptual or, or philosophical arguments. You know, if you go back to like way back, you know, Turing, um, people like that. They write all sorts of like super philosophical papers, right? Like the Turing test was like a really philosophical paper, um, and like not all of it stands up. There is a section in it on how uh, because uh, ESP has been established uh, to exist with high probability, that like creates problems for the Turing test. Um, and you're like, okay, where does that come from? Well, it actually turns out that like a lot of scientists in, in Turing's time. Uh, thought that ESP existed based on some some experiments that someone had done that later ended up having like severe issues, but but they were like very subtle, severe issues. Um, so it's like, yeah, I think if you do kind of more philosophical stuff, uh, some percentage of it is going to end up looking like that, but some percentage of it is going to be the Turing test. Um, and, you know, I think, I think the like, increased recall of really good ideas like that is, is kind of worth the, the decreased precision. Uh, I mean, we, we obviously need sort of standards to, to kind of judge those arguments. Um, but right now what's happening is all those arguments are happening uh, kind of like next to the ML field rather than like within the ML field. And so that I don't think that's a, like that's not going to improve the quality of, of arguments. It's going to be much better if you kind of have have a community of, of people with on the ground experience also also participating in this. So I think that might be the biggest change I'd personally like to see. You know, now that we are we've begun sort of requiring sections, we could we could force people to next to the broader impact section, we could also, you know, do a philosophical musings section where you have to reflect on the long term and, and sort of paperclip st maximizer style impacts of your work? Well, yeah, I'm not sure I want to force people to do that. Um, uh, It'd be fun, and, and though, I think, right? like, Yeah, I, I think, like, I guess I'd rather have, like, a track or, or venue for, for kind of talking about these. And also for the broader impact stuff, to be honest, because I think um, a lot of the broader impact sections of, of these papers are, are kind of cookie cutter, and, and people are just, like, filling it out because they feel like they need to to add that section uh but you know there's other researchers who i think are super thoughtful about the broader impacts and, and have like really good thoughts um and so uh i like i'd like there to just be you know venues uh and, and like there are to some extent right but like i i think there should just be like more more of a culture of like yeah, like let's have, you know, an essay about the broader impacts and like that's like a reasonable contribution or, or kind of, you know, this like very conceptual essay about like weird stuff that could happen in the future and that that's a valid contribution. So I, I think that that's maybe what I want more of. Cool. Yeah, that's a good message to all the, the people who who think about organizing workshops and so on. This uh, would be neat topics that would make for interesting workshops, certainly at conferences. I'd certainly attend 
Yeah, it's funny because I also wrote a paper on troubling trends in machine learning scholarship where I argue against speculation. <laughs> um, but, but I think actually it's not really an argument against speculation. Speculation is, is really important. It's, it's that you need to separate speculation from, from the like solid stuff, yeah. right? If, if, you have, if you're like mixing it all together, then, then it's just a mess. But, but I think if it's kind of clearly labeled, uh, then, then you know that, that's a much uh, safer way to do things. This workshop is an opinion piece. Good. <laughs> is there any any uh, last thing you want to get out to people about this topic? Something we haven't touched on yet that you feel is important? Yeah, good question. Um, no, I, th I think you did a pretty good job of, of hitting it. Maybe the other thing I would just say is, is I think uh, like biology is a really interesting field where you also have kind of complex self-organizing systems and, and emergent behavior like we have in ML. And so I've personally gotten a lot out of just reading a lot about the history of biology. Um, so I, I'd recommend that. There's a couple of really good books. One is The Eighth Day of Creation. Um, it's it's kind of long, but but very well written. And um, and I think if, if people want like a good nonfiction book, I, I highly recommend it to people. Cool. Your blog is Bounded Regret, right? People can find you there. Yep. Excellent. Well, Jacob, thank you very much for being here. This was really cool. Yeah, thank you. I'll see you around. Yep, see you around.